Good morning, everyone, from a sunny Glasgow. Very, very unusual. <laughs> I'm sorry I can't be with you, but because of COVID restrictions, um, unfortunately, I'm stuck here. Uh, I was looking forward to sharing one or two beers with you at the bar last night, but unfortunately, that's not been possible. Um, you guys in FIPRO, you guys in FIPRO will know that um, I've been very passionate about this uh, issue of match fixing since I went to Thessalonica along with uh, Theo Van Seglin and Philip Piat and Frederick in 2010. And we heard the testimony of many of the players there and um, we were shocked. We'd heard stories before, but to hear the actual stories from the players was very, very sad. And it's from that day really that FIPRO decided to embark on looking at these issues and how we at FIPRO uh, and the governing bodies could confront this. And if you look at the last decade, um, FIPRO pr produced the Black Book in 2012, um, the Don't Fix It Project 2015, and the Employment Report in 2017. And the link there in terms of governance and to prevent match fixing was that the issue of governance played a large part in, in all these reports. And they're all done by academic research and they were acknowledged um, eventually by the governing bodies as being a true testimony to the situation in, in football, in professional football in, in Europe. Um, so I'm delighted. We've got four excellent speakers here today. Um, I've been in touch with all of them um, to get their brief CVs. Uh, I won't get into any great detail, but um, our first speaker is uh, Hale Warner from the Dutch National Platform. He's a, a former professional athlete, an Olympian. He's also been an athlete rep on many, many boards in, in, in sport. And for the last two years, has been the coordinator of the national platform in the Netherlands. So we could ask Eo to give his five minute presentation. Then we'll have the other three guys at the end of it, who have a question and answer from the floor. So we'll hand over to Eo now. Thank you, uh, Tony. And uh, thank you, Steve, for the, for, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, as Tony mentioned, I have a bit of a dual background, and I'll tell something about uh, governance from uh, also a dual perspective. One is uh, my uh, my at my being an athlete and being uh, involved in uh, all kinds of different uh, sport administrative jobs, but I work professionally in uh, the financial sector as a tax lawyer, so that's a bit of a, a different perspective. Um, so I've been asked to say something about governance, and maybe it's good to remind everybody that governance is about. Uh, the, the process of decision making and the process of implementing decisions um, and basically anything you come up with uh, any good idea um, needs to have strong governance backing it up backing it up otherwise it couldn't cannot be implemented in a meaningful way uh, and that's the same for sport in other sectors uh, like pharmaceutical sector or the financial industry uh, although in one sense sport is a very unique sector uh, in the sense that it's largely left alone to govern itself uh, based on the European model of sports which you probably all know um, it's, it's unique in that sense um, and that also leaves uh, an issue a consequence that a lot of the uh, stakeholders that would normally step in such as law enforcement if you see criminal activity uh, they are fairly reluctant to step in uh, and take up things in sport where they would in other parts of society. So that's, uh, in my view, uh, something that's changing slowly, uh, but that's an important consequence of the way sport is organized. Um, well, coming back to the topic of, uh, of match fixing, why we are here today. Um, basically, the last decade we've seen a lot of uh, well, scandals in sport. We've seen cor corruption in my own sport, track and field, let's say close at home, but also football. Uh, individuals and groups corrupting whole sport systems. And we've seen states condone doping, um, get off with a slap on the wrist, in my view, at least. Um, and we've seen countries buying their way to hosting major sporting events. And as a fan of sports, it's given me a lot that really hurts. Um, I think in why we are here today, match fixing, uh, there are three main areas we always talk about, which is prevention, detection and sanctioning. And the research done by Steve in the, in the group uh, has focused on, uh, on prevention. Uh, but I think traditionally a lot of efforts has been going into those three areas in tackling the, the problem of match fixing. However, there's not always a strong link between 
uh, the governance um, and tackling match fixing. So whatever we come up with in prevention, detection, if we detect something and it ends up in a poorly system, poorly governed system, the whole system doesn't function properly uh, and it's not effective in the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got long arms, but not that long. Um, so this is basically what I'm saying. I don't want to kill you with slides. You're going to probably see enough of those today. Um, so only after some serious scandals over the last couple of years have the has the governance really got uh, the attention it deserves, in my uh, opinion, uh, leading to a lot of governance reviews in federations uh, and the setting up of in integrity units in many, many, many sports. Um, besides the improvements in sport itself, I think my feeling is that sport is more willing to concede that it's not equipped, uh, not authorized, uh, and not skilled to do certain things, and is leaving rooms for others to step in. So the next step is... That's for instance law enforcement. Uh, it's good to see Interpol is here. Um, step in and take that place um, so uh, the cooperation can truly be a co cooperation. Uh, however, in cooperating between sport and the public domain, um, governance issues multiply exponentially. Um, in particular, with re regard to match fixing, there are also some other things to take into account. In sport, generally, um, Integrity has been a, a, a balancing item in the accounting. It's something that's done, uh, but still with some reluctance. Um, the main focus has been on the commercial side, and especially in these COVID times, it's understandable that you want to keep go keep getting the money in and s keep running uh, above any other issue you, mi you might face. Um, as I mentioned, I've worked in the financial in industry, so maybe this is a, a nice mom moment to pause and think about a, a, a small parallel I want to draw. Uh, it's a sector, le sport is a sector left to govern itself. It's a, got a strong commercial driver, uh, little to no risk awareness, and there's hardly any external oversight. Um, I hope this sounds familiar to some people who were around in 2008. Um, so something else that complicates matters is that there's no clear view on the issue of match fixing. Uh, we really don't know what the nature is or the extent of it. Uh, and research done by Steve and his group helps in this sense. What we still do not know is every other match fix. Is it certain geographies? Is it certain levels of competition? Is it only friendlies? Is it sport related? Is it betting related? Uh, and if so, uh, with the betting related, is organized crime involved or is it lone wolves operating? We just do not know. This leaves uh, a lot of um, all the stakeholders basically figuring out for themselves what the scope should be they work on, figuring out their own ambitions, and their priorities given to fighting match fixing. Uh, and this does not help uh, cooperation. And it also leads to endless debates, which I and Jan Peter are part of, about who's, who's, who's responsible, who should take uh, action, who's, uh, whose jurisdiction it is, etc. cetera. Um, lastly, some other complicating factors are the cross-border components in match fixing. Um, GDPR is one that probably everybody could do without, uh, and also AML regulations. So is it all bad then? No, I don't think so. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of steps being taken in the last couple of years to improve governance. Um, and the research done, such as this project, helped in shedding a light on how big the issue is and what we can do to tackle it. Um, but for me, the silver lining is really in um, looking at other sectors. Um, basically, everything sport is facing now, other sectors have already faced and overcome. So I think it, it's a good thing that sport looks outside uh, and learns from others. And hopefully uh, we learn from each other today and take this home and uh, improve our situations back uh, where we came from. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for that, Hale. And um, I think you raised uh, many important points, uh, particularly that um, the understanding that match fixing affects all sports. I remember in 2014 when the Commonwealth Games were in Glasgow, and I was asked to speak to all the governing bodies in Scotland about match fixing, and they perceived it as a football problem. I think we're all aware that this is a problem in all sports. And also, Hale mentioned that um, sports need support from other authorities, be it the police or uh, in the international organisations like Interpol and Europol. They do require that support. And again, a perennial problem within sport is the lack of external oversight, which Hale mentioned as well. There's many issues there, I think, that would be useful when we get to the, the panel discussion. 
But moving on, um, conscious of time, we're going to have uh, Jean Peter now, who is a KNVB Integrity Manager. He joined the KVNB in 2010 as Head of Club Licensing. He's worked on many different UEFA groups and committees over the last few years, and since 2018 has overall responsibility for integrity matters in Dutch football. I'll hand you over now to Jan Peter. Well, thanks, Tony, um, and thank you for FIFPRO. Always a pleasure to be here. Um, for me, because of course we did a pre-meeting uh, in order to set the, the stage for, for a good debate, I will give you a sort of Snapchat on the governance of, of Dutch football. Uh, many of the things that, that, that Giel actually mentioned could have been included in my presentation, but in order to give you a complete view, I will just focus on, on, on like I said, Dutch football and do some cherry picking on the governance of, of Dutch football uh, to give you a bit of an idea where we stand, what we can do, and some things we, uh, we cannot do. Um, first of all, what's very important, of course, we are a football association. That means that we have some rules of responsibilities. I think in the Netherlands we've got a huge social responsibility, but there are things we can do and we cannot do it. That will have an impact on the debate we can have in a sec on how to, how to tackle match fixing. Uh, what, you, what I want you to take from this slide, uh, just being a corporate chart of the Dutch Fuller governance, is that um, although we sometimes overrule things in the Netherlands, this particular slide gives you the idea that uh, the Dutch KNVB doesn't have just one president or one guy setting the tone in what direction we're going. Because we are divided between grassroots and professional football, and these two then come together into a football association meeting with separate board members, with one direction team, or with separate board members. Um, it gives us a bit of an idea on how we are organized and the sense that I think compared to other countries, it is not always that, uh, let me just say very politely, that the president and the clubs can actually decide where the integrity policy goes to. Um, so this structure is of importance. And I think also this landscape for you is important to see how Dutch football is organized. We don't have in the Netherlands, like you know, like in the Bundesliga, the Premier League, or even the Jupiter League, an organization with a structure where the league is, is doing uh, the, the, the competition. That's still with the KNVB. Then again, uh, both clubs and players are represented in our General Assembly. And also the leagues are very much part of our organization structure. So on important topics like tackling match fixing, you will see them organized in committee meetings. You will see them also having a part in how we design and how we structure our policies. Like I said, I'm doing a snapshot, so it's, it's not just that you have to go into detail what's every on the slide, and we can talk about this later. Uh, what does that mean when it comes to a policy? Um, the integrity policy of the KNVB is very much relied on now four pillars. Traditionally, you will see three. You will see doping, you will see sexual harassment, you will see match fixing and gambling. Uh, like Tony mentioned, is that my history with the KNVB very much started as head of club licensing. Uh, and as head of club licensing, I was very much focused on financial integrity. And it doesn't come to a surprise being in the house of FIFPRO that I had a very good look also on the black book and the issues of club ownership. Uh, so I started designing something like Know Your Owner in 2012, 2013, which was introduced in 2018. Knowing where the money comes from and knowing who's in actually running your competition is very important in order to design an integrity policy. So our integrity policy, it says here, we've got one pillar called match fixing and gambling, but the one other one's called financial integrity. That's our fourth pillar. And one of the things I wanted to stress out today is that the link between those two is very important. We tend to focus on tackling match fixing and how we relate as a football association with French law enforcement and what we are doing on exactly the three pillars Gil just mentioned. Um, but it's also very important to get a link between the financial integrity, how the club is run, and how you can actually design a strategy to tackle match fixing. When it comes to governance, because of course that's the main topic right now today, you will see that as a football association, we've got a horizontal and a vertical way of working. Uh, traditionally wise, we're very, very linked of course with UEFA and FIFA when it comes to 
all three pillars, mostly focused on creating awareness, monitoring, investigating, as you know, via companies like sport radars, etc. We are involved. Um, but for instance, awareness and education is not something we tend to do, for instance, with law enforcement. We had one or two pilots this year, where Gil, or someone from the police, where ourselves sat together and gave, for instance, instruction to the police. But it's something that's not really already uh, uh, developed, and you could actually argue, should you, should you not also, on the education side, come more close together between football and, uh, and for instance, law enforcement or, or members of the national platform. Um, how are we then organized? What, what do we do? Well, some things are really, I mean, this is not a, not a huge uh, uh, new, new slide. Of course, we've got the disciplinary rules. Like any other associate, probably we will say something about what you can and cannot do and how you have to report when you are approached for match gambling, match fixing. I think one of the great things uh, were just mentioned in the introduction is, is the red button app. We are right now in connection with, with members of FIFPRO to get it introduced into Dutch football. And I think that's a really good thing. And hopefully in the future, it will not just be for, for, for players. Of course, our ambition, ambition will always be that it will also be available for referees and for all those involved as, as, as members of football. Um, we've got a disciplinary process. And I think it is good to stress out that in the Netherlands, we work uh, with prosecutors, also in football. So those who are actually involved in their own capacity outside football as prosecutor are volunteering as prosecutor also within football. That means something about the independency of, for instance, a disciplinary procedure. And I know, of course, we can have a debate about that one, but I've seen it in practice over the last 10 years, also with club licensing. Um, here in the Netherlands, we are often challenged on what we do eventually in court. And one of the things you have to really be good at as an association, follow your own rules and make sure that when you are assessed in court that you've done your pro procedure properly. We've got an independent in integrity committee and that's really independent. The chairman is here today uh, and we've got prosecutors uh, at work. I know you can argue that at the end of the day, independency, you're still probably within the statutes of the KNVB, but you have to act, I think if you want to really assess what's independent, you have to assess the procedure. And it's been challenged now many times also in court, and I still have to say, until to this day, um, every time it was ruled in favor of us. Um, so uh, this is what we do. Uh, of course, we do a lot of awareness training. We do that together with, the K with UEFA and FIFA. Um, and actually, next week, we've got an initiative with all stakeholders in Dutch football, how we can extend uh, with the leagues, with the referees, the, the number of, of sessions in order to, to create awareness on, on match fixing, not just having it relied on the football association, but bring it to, to, to a larger uh, group as a whole. And finally, um, match fixing is not just about tackling uh, what actually is, is, is happening on the pitch. It's also a lot about preventive measures. And like I mentioned, um, I think we just had a, a good introduction from, from a gentleman from, from Cyprus. Of course, Cyprus had his, his experience with appointment of referees. One of the things we introduced a couple of years ago is a different way of appointment of referees to take it out of the governance structure of board members and bring it completely to the technical department and make it only their decision which referee is appointed to what game. That's on the one side. On the other side is, and I think certainly the the people here from the Netherlands uh, might still remember that a couple of years ago we started our league, our first and second competition with minus 23 points on the table sheet. From those minus 23 points, uh, numbers were awarded on clubs not paying their players. This was 2011. Since then, you haven't seen one single point deduction in that area, making it work. So preventive measures we took is having a very strict club licensing system. And we've got a very uh, long history in that one. And I think we're also really front runners in how you assess clubs. And the other thing is just what I just mentioned, the introduction of, of Know Your Owner, which is actually quite interesting to round it off. Um, it's actually simply know your client or know your customer, but in Dutch football. And I remember when I started thinking about this, that the first response from the association was, on what kind of rules should we do this? And I said, it's not just the rule, because actually, officially by the rule, 
it should be done by all those professionals involved in the club takeover not being the football association. So we think about auditors, the notaries who receive the money for the first takeover bid, um, legal people involved. I said, but there is a social responsibility that will probably push it towards us that we have to do this. So since 2018, we introduced this in Dutch football. Um, one could still argue, is it at the right spot? But I think since then, uh, we've seen, of course, certain takeovers being prevented, certain takers being allowed. It gives us a bit of an insight in who is actually behind the club, and I think that's, that's essential when it comes about uh, tackling match fixing. Like I said, this is just a brief snapchat, so uh, I, I hand back uh, the, the, the word to Tony. Uh, thank you, Jan Peter. That was very, very interesting. You covered important points there, particularly to have a, a, a proper structure in your football. And I think the club ownership, know your own owner, uh, is a good example. I'm sure many countries will look to adopt that in the future because I know that causes many problems, not only in Europe, but throughout world football. And also the importance within the structure of involving the players as you do in the Netherlands, that's particularly important as well because the players are part of the solution and then should be included in these discussions. We're going to move on to our next speaker that will be known to many of you, um, Alex Phillips, um, who's worked for both FIFA and UEFA. He's now a consultant, um, but he's also worked in governance and compliance for the last 20 years. I know that Alex worked closely with me and, and Theo and Seglin on on the minimum requirements some 15 years ago. We're still waiting for that to be implemented fully, Alex, so hopefully you can help us there, but um, but we look forward to hearing your contribution. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. <clears throat> so I have five minutes, if I understand correctly. Uh, so I'll try to be concise. Greetings from Schiphol Airport, five kilometers away. I made it that far, but couldn't make it out of the airport, I'm afraid. Uh, but nevertheless, thank you for the invitation. Uh, as Tony mentioned, I've worked in uh, governance and compliance over many years in different federations. I also worked four years in Asia, in the Asian Football Confederation, helping them with their governance, uh, following some corruption scandals. So I have a very much a governance perspective on this we won't go into the definition of governance uh, as everyone has their own one but as uh, was summarized at the start it's about decision making how the decisions are made i think the key point to make is that in federations obviously fighting match fixing is a team effort at not just federations it's clubs leagues players uh, government law enforcement etc but from the perspective of the federations we have to recognize that there is a fundamental conflict of interest, a structural conflict of interest within federations, namely that to promote and sell the sport conflicts sometimes with regulating the sport. Um, this applies not just to match fixing, it could be doping or other integrity issues, but this uh, structural conflict of interest is at the heart of many of the problems that we see on the Federation side. Uh, and that's not the only conflict of interest because there are other ones. So I mean, in practical terms, the, the reality is that to, to, be, to get power, to become the president essentially of a Federation, and during this talk, I'm not gonna talk about specific Federations, whether international, regional, national, local, just, rather talk in generic terms, but basically to generalize, and it's not like this in the Netherlands, but in a lot of the world, the president has all of the power in the organization. It's as simple as that. So the governance structure of many federations is basically like an absolute monarchy. It's not like a company. It's not like a government body. It's not like an NGO. The most appropriate governance analogy is an absolute monarchy. And what did, what did they do, the absolute monarchies? They separated the judicial from the executive, from the legislative. legislative. And this is the history of the US and France uh, and other countries. It's why the United Nations has principles for the independence of judiciaries around the world. <clears throat> and it hasn't been implemented around the world, but nevertheless, this is something we have not 
managed yet to move towards in sport. So I was asked to give some practical examples of where governance and uh, match fixing, there is a link, a concrete link. Uh, and I mean, I can give an example again, I'm not going to cite specific organizations, but I know one federation where <clears throat> the policy is to do three cases per year, not more, not less, because this they feel is, is the right number to make it look like something is happening, uh, whilst at the same time not causing too many political problems. And remember that if you want to be elected on international level, you depend on people on national level. And the people on national level, they also depend on people on local level, or it could be clubs. So <clears throat> the federation president on national level uh, hears that at one of his clubs, or and it's normally a him, of course, because it's mainly men, uh, one of his clubs is being investigated for match fixing gives a call to the international federation what's going on what you know there's elections next year you know i supported you last time joined to support you next time this is causing me a headache because i got to power nationally because <clears throat> i relied on the vote of this club or this regional federation uh nationally locally and so it goes on down the chain this this governance problem so that's that's a practical example the same federation uh, the whistleblowing hotline, where did the information go? Did it go to an independent trained uh, individual or entity that could treat sensitive information uh, with the sensitivity needed? No, it didn't. It went to the political uh, manager within the federation who would then obviously use the information in perhaps ways that it shouldn't have been used. Then I could go on, I think I'm reaching my, my five minutes, uh, but there are many, many different examples we could probably come back to in, the, uh, in the, uh, the panel discussion. I'll give another example of a country. <clears throat> this is an EU country, and this is from a US government cable. Soccer in this country has become a symbol of organized crimes, corrupt influence on important institutions. Soccer clubs are widely believed to be directly or indirectly controlled by organized crime figures who use their teams as a way to legitimize themselves, launder money, et cetera, match fixing, and so on. So that's happening in EU countries, and that's the people responsible for governance, the people with all the power. Not everywhere, of course, but in some countries, this is the reality. So of course, if that's the governance structure, then you have no hope of concretely fighting match fixing or any other integrity issue for that matter in uh, in countries like that. So I think I've gone over my time and uh, I will hand back to you, Tony, as chair. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, I, I didn't think you would name names. Maybe you can do that privately later on somewhere, you know. But uh, yeah, you, you, there is some really important issues there, Alex. Um, about how the selling of the sport can conflict with the running of the sport. And we know that's very often the case in commercial income, where a, a federation may adopt a sponsor, which conflicts with other integrity issues. Um, it was interesting, you, your analogy with uh, a, an absolute monarchy, you know, and, and uh, you work with FIFA under King Blatter, so maybe you experienced some of that there. Um, and also the, the three cases per year, um, we discover that ourselves, that very often as a front, uh, a federation will prosecute some cases per year just to keep it uh, keep it simmering, but they don't want to, ex to explode and actually get to the actual numbers involved. And also that the importance probably of, of the red button when you mentioned that whistleblowing can be problematic in some countries and the information is actually harnessed by the very people themselves you wish to report on. So that's something that um, you highlighted as well. Thanks very much, Alex. And Last but not least, uh, Guy Renenberg, who's uh, with us this morning, who's from the Belgium National Platform. Um, he's worked in the, the sports fraud team and the federal police. And uh, he's going to highlight a couple of cases in Belgium that I think will be very relevant to this conference. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me uh, in uh, participating at this uh, very important event. Uh, my apologies uh, for not being able to come over in person. 
uh, but hopefully this uh, virtual uh, participation can make uh, things right. Um, yes, the topic uh, was link between uh, governance and match fixing. And uh, I will refer to two practical cases uh, in Belgium. Um, the first one uh, was the Zi Yunye case, the Chinese businessman who uh, uh, was uh, fixing matches in, in the years 2006, 2000, and the investigation went on to 2006, 2012. Uh, and then uh, I will touch uh, uh, an ongoing operation, but very briefly and very specifically in the condition reform, because uh, as you all know, when you follow the press, uh, Belgian press was uh, nearly exploding uh, a couple of days ago with new, uh, yeah, new information was going out. So uh, I will be very briefly for the second one. Uh, the first, the first case, Zi Yunye, the Chinese businessman who influenced uh, Belgian football and shocked Belgian football uh, in the years 2005-2006. That this was the very first earthquake uh, in Belgium. Um, we had, uh, when we're talking about governance, uh, we had this uh, Chinese businessman, um, yeah, uh, having uh, club officials. Uh, we had the club members, we had players uh, believed uh, that this so called investor uh, would be the new club owner. So we, there was a, a little, uh, yeah. Uh, if there was yeah okay sorry uh, just about if there was a more transparency uh, within the club within the club officials and uh, within uh, the players uh, of that specific club uh, there could not be and we're talking about a, a specific club Leeds at that moment uh, was nearly uh, in relegation uh, when there was more transparency within this this club. There could not be any wrong interpretation, and therefore players could not listen to promises concerning new uh, lucrative uh, contracts. What was this uh, Chinese businessman doing at that time? Uh, he was presenting himself at the club officials as a new investor. Um, all the players of that club and supporters and every people uh, were uh, involved in that uh, specific club, they were thinking that he would be the new investor, and so they thought uh, they had to believe him when he was proposing behind the curtains, of course, to all the players, uh, the, the important players, new uh, contracts where they could earn uh, nearly the double of their salary that was going on at that moment. But they didn't know that afterwards, the club officials uh, refused the offer of the taking over of the club. So the good in, in uh, talking about good governance, when there was more uh, control, when there was more transparency from the higher club uh, level to the players level, we could avoid uh, this catastrophe. Um, when we are talking about the second, the second case is a case going on and it's uh, called uh, Clean Hands uh, in Belgium. Um, I, I will talk, uh, I will speak in the condi conditional form because it's an going on case, but specifically what uh, was already uh, mentioned in the press, we had a club um, that uh, had a reasonable uh, good governance. Club officials were talking to each other what was going on. There was a, a very, uh, very open in their um, in their uh, contribution uh, to, to uh, what was going on in the club higher level and to the players level or to the supporters level. Um, but this club, uh, we are talking about uh, the, the uh, match fixing. There was uh, there an, an um, accuse of match fixing uh, to avoid relegation. And we see that even when there is good governance, when they are open about their uh, financial uh, status, when they are open, open, uh, what is going on uh, in, in, in uh, the, the um, board, on the board level of the, that club, we can see that it, this has no influence on uh, the match fixing at itself. At the contrary, we saw that there was a broad acceptance within the board, the club officials, 
the players, the uh, the supporters, uh, that there was a broad acceptance that um, yeah that it is that match fixing was a necessary evil to avoid relegation. So we we can speak uh, nearly. Oh, it seems to be that even all means are good the, to achieve the outcome. And and nat naturally, this is in the conditional form. But uh, when we are speaking about good governance, um, yes, it is good. Uh, and I heard uh, the previous speaker uh, that um, yeah, that an external oversight and control is very useful. I can even say it's necessary to prevent sports from match fixing. The uh, external control is something you need. Um, yeah, uh, confidence is good, uh, but control is better. And uh, in Belgium, I can uh, I can tell you that there, there we had several. Our uh, uh, Belgian Football Association has, and, and, and our politicians have taken important uh, steps. Um, we know the know your own uh, principle uh, we talked about uh, earlier uh, is is very important, and and we are working about it from uh, the federal police side. Uh, but also um, the Belgian uh, Football Association is working on it. We have uh, the new development on the clearing house where transfers are passing through, payments uh, are uh, looked at, and uh, we have new money laundering rules uh, in Belgium, and, and uh, we hope to have uh, more uh, information about that side. So I, I'm nearly at the five minutes, I think, and uh, I'm open to the question and answer uh, session. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, guys, on that very interesting perspective um, from Belgium. I think many of us um, heard of the case of the Chinese involvement in around 2005, and suppose that's a lesson. Know your owner, but also know your investor. Uh, I know that's a problem in many, many clubs. Um, and also that um, quite interesting what you said in terms of the clean hands, that the match fixing has been accepted by many parties to avoid relega relegation, almost a legitimate way to avoid it. And I think that's something we have to dispel as quickly as we can as well. So thanks very much to the four participants. Um, I'm sure you'll find that, or you'll know that they made excellent contributions.